Wednesday night in the month of October. We're going to be preaching through God's prophecies, believing that God still has a work to do. What do you say? So we encourage you to come if you have not come. Today, we're going to speak on a subject that unfortunately has not been preached on often. It's a shame to say that as I look through my sermon archive to find one sermon on heaven, it was scarce, few and far between. But today we're going to pause and just talk about not where we are, but where we're going. Is that all right? The scripture was read so ably. If you would just pray with me, we're going to ask God to give us unction today as we preach on the subject, a perfect home in a perfect place. Father, now <clears throat> disappoint us not, for we need a word from the Lord. We focus our attention today on the fact that this world is not our home, that we're passing through, and our desire are an impact for the kingdom of God. And if you do that for us, Father, we'd be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and glory. Prepare us now, Lord, for a perfect home in a perfect place is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let those who believe say amen. Perfect home in a perfect place. My first pastoral assignment was in the pristine city of Asheville, North Carolina. Any of you who know anything about Asheville, North, North Carolina, knows that it is one of the most beautiful cities in the nation with breathtaking mountain range views and picturesque scenery. In the summer, the plush green foliage spreads its manicured canopy across the Blue Ridge Mountains, making it a place that most people call an abode. In the fall, nature channels its inner Picasso and Michelangelo as it begins to paint the treetops with hues of yellow and splashes of red. And then in the winter, there is no better place to experience the joy of the holidays than to find yourself singing yuletide songs in this small mountain retreat. Now, being designed, being assigned, pardon me, to such a desirable location, I just deemed that it would be good stewardship, hear me now, good stewardship to purchase a home that would capitalize on such an amazing view. You know, you have to spiritualize that thing sometimes to, to, to rationalize your decisions. Are you hearing me? So it's a good stewardship move that I must, in fact, ask God that, God, the only homes that I desire to look at will be the homes with mountain views, waterfront property, and a balcony hanging out for my master bedroom. Come on and say amen. I believe God's people ought to live well. What do you say? So I began praying for that thing. I did my research, hear me, and I found a development that was called the Cliffs at Walnut Cove. Never forget it. I was in the, lab, in the, in the airport, pardon me. And I saw the advertisement hanging out of the USA Today, and I said, you know what? I just feel in my spirit, in my spirit, that this is where God wants me to live. So I decided to take a drive, decided to take a drive by to scout out the scene, only to discover that these were no entry-level homes. These, <laughs> y'all hear me today? Yeah, these were the homes for the big baller shot callers, you know, interpret that for somebody who may not know what's happening next to you. And because I knew I was not making Creflo dollar money, can I get a witness in the house? I knew, <laughs> hear me, that I would have to settle for another, talking about a perfect home in a perfect place. I continued my housing search, refusing to relinquish my expectations because I didn't see myself crunched up in an apartment. You know, sermon preparation doesn't work well when you're confined. So... <laughs> That's not how I envisioned myself. I saw myself waking up to a fresh brewed cup of postum. Now, those of you who may not know what postum is, in my large house, I saw myself cracking over a fresh copy of the New York Times, walking out on the balcony of my house to watch the sunrise over the Blue Ridge Mountains. Can you see that thing with me today? That's what I saw. These expectations <laughs> continued for about a month until I had a head-on collision with another vehicle called Sticker Shock. Now, anybody who lives in Washington, D.C., you know exactly what Sticker Shock is, don't you? So here it was. Finally, after weeks of agonizing with my options, reality set in, and I realized that I was going to have to downgrade a little bit. So here it is. It was not the sprawling estate 
that allowed me to look out on the Blue Ridge Mountains. No, it was just a small 1,100-foot townhome that allowed me to look into the face of my neighbor because we were living so close together. And I kind of had, I kind of had issue. Hear me today. I had issue with God about that thing. I was, I was, I was vexed in my spirit, as the old folks say. And I, I began to, to talk to God about this thing. I voiced my concerns and said, God, I didn't ask you for a gated community. Didn't ask you for a sprawling estate. Didn't ask you for a mansion. All I asked for, well, hear me, was a small villa with great views, waterfront options, and a balcony overlooking the Blue Ridge Mountains. That's all I asked you for. I was about to hear me, church. Watch and stay with me. I was about to go into moping mode until I heard God say to me, Braun, before you start pouting, let me help you out. Not only did I hear your prayer, but I answered your prayer. He said, you asked for a house overlooking the pristine mountains? You got it. You asked for a balcony hanging from your master bedroom? You got it. You ask, watch this, for a house with pristine water views and garden villas, you got it. He said, now if I gave it to you now, you would have to pay for it. You'd have to pay mortgage, taxes, insurance, repairs. We'll have a witness in the house about, about paying for it. He said, but, but, but if I gave it to you in the earth made new. <laughs> he said, you could live, watch this, like a prince and send your bill to the king. LeBron, watch this. He said, I already told you, I already told you that I have gone to prepare, hallelujah, a place for you. And the Bible says it this way in John 14, 1 through 3, let not your heart be what? You believe in who, everybody? Believe also in me. In my Father's house, watch this, are many what? Don't miss that. God says one house, many mansions. Woo! He said, I got one house, but my house, oh, Lord, I'm, listen, y'all don't have to, y'all, listen, you, you all can go home. I'm going to enjoy this by myself today. I've got one house, and the house is so bad, choir, that I have many mansions in one house. If it were not so, I would have told you. The Bible says, I go to prepare a what? And if I go and prepare a place for you, hallelujah, he says, I will come again and do what? Ooh, that where I am, you may be also. What? Look at, come on, let's just give, give God an amen this morning. I would love it to hear me. And friend of mine, don't get me wrong today. I appreciate the fact that Jesus helps me pay my bills. I appreciate the fact that he heals my diseases. I appreciate the fact that he keeps me safe on the highways. I appreciate the fact that he keeps me sane. But beloved, I want to suggest today that when it comes down to serving Jesus, there is no incentive better than the fact that God gives us a perfect home in a perfect place. In fact, Jesus says the joys of heaven are so therapeutic, it's so awesome that when you get there, you will forget all of the pain you ever experienced on earth. Bible says that, that, that heaven is so awesome that it wipes your memory clear of every heartache, every despondent thought, every, every act of Satan. He says it wipes it clear. How do you know? Here's what the Bible says. Isaiah 65, 17, for behold, I create new heavens and a what? And God said, the thing is so bad, the former shall not be what? <laughs> or come to mind. God said, it's so awesome, you're going to try to think about uh, depression, but it won't come to mind. You're going to try to remember funerals and you have amnesia. You're going to try to remember heartache and pain and it just doesn't register. You're going to try to remember the time when you were flat on your back and God says, stop worrying about it. Heaven is cheap enough and it's good for your soul. I would say God is able today. In other words, heaven is so awesome. Watch this. That when you get there, you forget all about the time when they had you on the hospital bed with chemotherapy running through your veins. Heaven is so awesome. You forget all about the time when you had to go to the funeral home. Watch this. And bury members and loved ones who are gone too soon. Heaven is so awesome. You forget all about the time you had to go to the courthouse and go through divorce court. You took the blender. She took the toaster. You lost everything but your mind. Come on and say amen. amen. You forget all, all about the time when your child was sent away too soon because the glory of heaven is just that therapeutic. God says, I've got so much joy for you in heaven. Whew, this thing is good to me. That it will make you forget the trauma of this earth. So here's our, we'll have three questions today and then we're done. When shall we receive this home? 
That's what I want to know. Because, folks, I'm telling you, I, I, listen, I still have the church. I still have not received my mansion yet. My wife and I live in a townhome. It's all right. I mean, come on now. It's all right. You know, we're not complaining. I'm not, not trying to be big head. You hear me today? But listen, I still, brother Frank, I still want my spread. Do you hear me today? So when is it coming? The Bible makes it clear, beloved, today that right now, according to John 14, 1 through 3, that Jesus is preparing a place for us as we speak. Heaven is one big construction zone. <laughs> Under review by heaven's general contractor. Ladies, watch this. Watch this. The angels are laying pearl countertops in your kitchen. <laughs> Brothers, Gabriel is designing your seaside golf course. Come on and say amen now. Huh? But there will come a day, hear me, there will come a day, there will come a day. Oh, yes, I forgot about that. Yes, no senior citizen homes in heaven. Come on and say amen. <laughs> Beloved, I want to suggest to you today that, that the Bible is clear there will come a day when construction will cease, when the angels will put down their hammers. The, constru the construction zone will be prepared for an open house. The father will give his final walkthrough, and when he gives his stamp of approval, he looks at Jesus and says, do your thing. Whew. And when he gives Jesus the nod, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, that the Lord himself, not one of his cronies, not sitting back up, he said, I'm coming for myself, for my people. Will descend from heaven with the what, everybody? Whew. With the voice of a what? And the trump of God and the who, everybody? In Christ shall rise first. Don't miss that. The Bible says that those who are dead will rise first in Jesus. Then we who are what? And what? Amen. Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, I don't know about you. I don't care how I get there, but it will be nice if no one would ever be able to pronounce a eulogy over my soul. Are you hearing me today? It would be nice if I would be able to just, just to move, transition. But listen, it doesn't matter if I have to die, so what? Just make sure that I make up at the right alarm button. Are you hearing me today? Lord, help me not to wake up on the, that third alarm. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's, listen, that's not a time to oversleep. Are y'all hearing me today? The Bible is clear first. The Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise. Who, everybody? That ought to make you shout today. Somebody has buried your grandfather too soon like mine. He says he will rise first. <laughs> Somebody has a mother lying in the grave right now. God says that because mama prayed, whoo, she prayed for me, had me on her mind, took the time to pray for me, that because she lived a life that was godly, she shall rise first. Some of you have children that you buried too soon. The Bible declares that the pain that you experience on the day of the funeral will be forgotten by the day of the resurrection. Because Jesus says, when I come, I'm going to raise up my people first. Come on and say amen about that thing. Wait a minute. That's, this is why, hear me, let me do a little teaching now. This is why the doctrine of immortality of the soul is so deadly to the body of Christ. Because if, as some suggest, I go directly to heaven once I die, then it nullifies the gift that God wants to give us on his return. You see, you see, you see God says, I got a gift for you. But Satan, you, you do know that Satan hates God's gifts. Do you, you, you do know that, don't you? Every gift that God gives, he tries to counterfeit it. And Satan says, I hate the fact that Braun going to get his spread. <laughs> so let me, let me fool those who are not steeped in the word to make them think that when they die, they go straight to heaven to make them believe that there really is no gift or no reason to be prepared for when he comes. Beloved, I want to suggest to you that is a lie from the pit of hell. The Bible makes it clear that we are not immortal until he comes, but when he comes, we shall be like he is. Hallelujah. But the Bible is clear, watch this, that those who have never tasted death also, the dead in Christ will do what? All right, that's teaching. Now watch this. Then the Bible says this. Then we who are what? And what? Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. The Bible says that everybody's going to be caught up together. Nothing secret about this rapture. Everybody gets to see because you do know that Jesus likes to show off. 
You see, watch this. The problem with the secret rapture is that it underestimates the character of God. God has characteristics that are not like us. He is jealous, and God likes to show off. So anybody who's jealous and likes to show off, you know that you don't do stuff in secret. Come on now. Ladies, you know that when you buy that dress, $500, you know you're not going to wear it by yourself. You want somebody to see that thing. Come on and say amen. The Bible is clear. Jesus wants to show off. <laughs> yes, he does. Now, now watch this. Watch. This, is, this is the reason. This is why we must understand this deadly notion. There is this notion floating in Christianity. Hear me today. That when Jesus comes to redeem his own, it will be a secret rapture, leaving sinners one more chance to get it right. You all perhaps have seen the movie Left Behind. I watched it. I did. I confess. I watched it. And it was good for entertainment value, but it was not true. Because it leads people to believe that I can wait for the rapture to get it right. Folk, when Jesus comes the first time, if you hadn't got it right, you will get left. <laughs> no pun intended. Are you hearing me today? This is why 2 Corinthians, hear me today, 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, In an acceptable time I've heard you, and in the day of salvation I have what? Yes. Behold, now is the what? Behold, now. When? Now. Now is the day of salvation. The Bible declares that when the Lord comes to redeem his people, he's going to take us on a two-part journey. So where are we going? This is why I've been trying to get here all day. Where are we going? What's this place going to be like? See, the problem with heaven is that we have no reference point. The best, we, the, the best depiction we have of heaven are the mansions we've seen that most of us can never get in. I've never seen a real mansion. I've seen a big house. I'm talking about, listen, a real, never been inside of one, a real, if you live in one, invite me. I want to come. I won't mess it up. I promise. I just want to see it. So I have a better reference point of what I may have. But you do know that the best mansion in heaven is like the doorstep of what God has in the new earth. Do you hear me today? So where are we going? This is what I'm going to talk about today. The first step on the journey, the Bible says, watch me. There are, there are two phases. How many phases? How many phases? Two phases. The first phase will be a, a thousand year stay at our father's house. <laughs> How do you know? Because the Bible says that after we are caught up, then he's going to take us to live at your father's house for a thousand years. How do you know? The Bible says, Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the what, everybody? And a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the who? And the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for how long? For a thousand years, the Bible says, and for those a thousand years, we have the opportunity just to hang out with Jesus. Now, folk, let me tell you something. I've heard folks say that, man, that's a long time to hang out with one person. Let me tell you something. That's because you've been hanging out with some boring people now. <laughs> see, see, if you're really, and those of you who've been married, you know, uh, and, and you got good friends if you're not married, you know, man, I can hang out with somebody I like for a long time. I like the prospect of hanging out with my wife for a thousand years, especially when the kids move out the house. Come on and say amen. <laughs> I like that thing. And the Bible says, man, that for a thousand years, we're going to hang out with Jesus. Well, what kind of house does he have? The Bible says, watch this, Revelation 21, 16, the city is laid out as a what? Its length is as great as its what? That means it's a perfect square. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 what, everybody? Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Now, I know we don't use furlongs. Let me help you. 12,000 furlongs equals 1,500 miles, which means whew, that for a 1,000 years, my house will stretch from Washington, D.C. to Puerto Rico, San Juan, Puerto Rico, from San Juan, Puerto Rico to Houston, Texas, from Houston, Texas to North Dakota, and from North Dakota back to Washington, D.C. See, that's why I'm not impressed with your little house. <laughs> <laughs> listen, why am I impressed with your little stuff and my little stuff? God says, I've got a, listen, I've got one house that can stretch half the continental U.S. of A. That, the, the, the Bible, listen, that's not, that's not all. Watch this. It gets, it gets gooder than this. <laughs> Bible says in Revelation 21, 17, watch this, that the city had 12, watch this. He measured its walls, 100, 100 yes, 144 cubits. 
according to the measure of a man that is an angel. 144 cubits, that's about one and a half football fields for, for all y'all Redskin fans. <laughs> just pause for a moment of silence, just for right. Pause for a moment of <laughs> pause for. <laughs> That's one and a half FedEx fields. Watch this. That's just the, that's the width of the walls. <laughs> Lord have mercy. That's the width of the walls. Now, wait a minute. It gets better. The Bible tells us then in Revelation 21, 20, uh, 21, 21, it says that, that there were 12 gates and 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold. Like transparent glass. <laughs> now, 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 I'm, I'm, now, hear me. Take this with a grain of salt. This is, this is why God is not impressed with jewelry. He's not impressed with it. Because he says, listen, the reason I'm not impressed with it is because you're going to walk on what you're now putting on. <laughs> God says, I've got one pearl, whew, my goodness, that will fit the gate of the city. Somebody asked, well, he's gonna get, where is he going to get an oyster that large? Listen, how many folks know that if God wants to make an oyster that large to make the pearl, God can do it by himself? That's what the Bible says. Then the Bible says, watch this, beloved, that after we have lived with him for a thousand years, that he will cleanse the earth, hallelujah, of its, of its impurities. Listen to what he says. He says, for behold, I create a new what? And a new what? Yes. In other words, he's creating a new heaven, but he's also going to create this earth over again. After Jesus has cleaned the earth, the Bible makes it clear that after he makes over the mountain ranges and the seas, and after he makes over the ocean plains, and after he rewires nature's fury to reflect the beauty of its creator, watch this, that he's going to allow Braun Jacobs to build his custom mansion that I could not get in Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, I'm, I'm in the Bible. I'm in the Bible. Listen, what? I'm in the Bible. So you all don't believe it. He says that when I cleanse the earth, now this, now I've, been, I've been waiting to get here all sermon. He says, they shall do what? Oh, come on. Come on. Wake up. I, he says, they shall what? Did it, not, listen, not I'm going to make them a house. He says, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Now, I, I know why some of you didn't say amen on this. Because see, this doesn't mean uh, a lot to some people. Because you've always been able to move into a custom-built house. Yeah, see, see, some of you, you always had custom countertops, custom cabinets, custom crown molding. That doesn't mean much to you. Every time you get a house, you get custom. Come on now. Huh? Custom. You don't want all of us. Custom. You build it yourself. But some of us in the building know what it's like to move into a cookie-cutter house. That's the house where you don't get a chance to choose your cabinets. They say, buy the house or move. I've always had cookie-cutter houses. Hey, but when I get the glory, the Bible says that I'm going to get a chance to sit down with the master general contractor and pick out everything I ever wanted and everything I could never give to my wife. Where's Ashley? Baby, you're going to get your kitchen one day. Yeah, we're going to get it one day. We may not get it down here, but one day we're going to get it, girl. Whatever you want, just send up your timber on your knees. Yes. And the Bible says that one day he will sit us down and ask us, what do you want in your house? And since I got the mic, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell him. I'm going to say, Lord, here's why I want the house. I want the house because I need a 2,700-square-foot uh, house. I need it all. I need, I need the indoor I need my balcony. Are you hearing me today? I need, listen, I need a studio in my house so David can come over and play the harp every now and then. I'm going to put it down because God makes it clear to us that he will give us everything that our hearts desire if, in fact, we're willing to sacrifice it down here. The problem is we have so many people trying to build their heavenly mansion on an earthly platform. God says, I can't bless that. I need people who believe that I have a perfect home in a perfect place. Now watch this, beloved. The Bible is clear tonight. Why is this important? Why is this important? Let me share, let me share with you why this is important, then I'm done. The reason that this is important 
is because there's an old song that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. The light of his what? Glory and grace. In other words, what the song is saying is that the more we behold the beauties of Jesus, is the less we feel the pain and the sorrow of this world. The more we cast our eyes on what God has to offer, is the less we feel the pain in this world. I remember a few years ago going through a stressful time in ministry. I was at a time where I had a building project going on. I was completing my doctorate of ministry paper. And we were on the heels of an evangelistic meeting. And I looked at Ashley and said, babes, we need to take a vacation, a real vacation. I'm not talking about a staycation. I mean like we're on a plane, cell phones don't work kind of vacation. So we saved up our money and we decided to take a vacation to Maui. Have you ever been to Maui? I'm telling you. Don't listen. Don't go to Maui unless you've visited other places first. It will ruin all of your vacation spots. <laughs> It'll ruin it. So we went to Maui, man. We 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 hung out and 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 one of the things I realized is that as soon as I bought the ticket to Maui, it is almost as if my stress level automatically began to go down. Watch this now. My circumstances had not changed. But I had Maui on my mind. <laughs> I still had the same stress level, but I didn't feel it. Why? Because I had Maui on my mind. I still had the same circumstances, still stressed out, still trying to meet deadlines, but it didn't matter. Why? Because Maui was on my mind. <laughs> and when I watched this, and when I reached Maui, it was better than what they advertised. And I realized, you know, it's sometimes it's good to keep your destination on your mind. Now, come on, let me help you. The reason that we have to keep heaven on our mind is because the more we keep heaven on our mind is the less we feel the sorrow of this earth. Because sometimes your circumstances will not change, but if you got heaven on your mind, it doesn't matter because Jesus will take the load for you. Sometimes your situation will not change, but if you got heaven on your mind, it'll change your, your worldview. And beloved, I don't know about you, but I've got heaven on my mind. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I cannot feel at home in this world anymore. I've got a new home. A home whose builder and maker is God. And every sorrow that I've experienced in this earth, God says, if you just hold on and give me your life, put it in my hands. I'll make sure that you forget every single unfortunate circumstance in your life in a moment. In a moment. We give God praise today. Heads about, eyes are closed. I want you to listen to this, to this appeal song. Because Jesus wants to say something to us today. Father, in the name of Jesus, speak to us now through the appeal and through this song. In Jesus' name. Listen to me. Listen to this. I want to put this on here. Isaiah, look at, look at this. Isaiah 35, 5. Why is it important? The Bible says, look, look, look at this home that God has for us. And then the eyes of the blind shall be what? The ears of the deaf shall be what? They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. What an awesome place. Look, look at this. Isaiah eleven six. 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the what? He's going to reverse the curse of nature. And any, any, anybody who's experienced what we have experienced the last few weeks, you know that nature itself is groaning for deliverance from its maker. Nature is saying, help. Help me. One day, he's coming. The leopard shall lie down with the young what? The calf and the young lion and the fat leg together. And a little child shall lead them. Love, and I want to suggest to us today that heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. It's a prepared place for prepared people. The day God is saying to some man, some woman, some boy, some girl, I don't want to live without you. The only person who will carry the pain, watch this, 
The only person who will carry the pain of missing members in heaven will be Jesus himself, who will carry that pain for eternity. He's going to wipe it out from us. But Jesus will miss you forever. Don't you disappoint him. Listen to the words of this song before I appeal today. The theme of the Bible is Jesus and how he died to save men. The plan of salvation assures us. He's coming back again. Oh, are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you faithful? coming and I'm coming soon. Isn't that good news? Man, that's good news. And when he comes, he has a perfect place, a perfect home and a perfect place. Today, as we have done, and some of you may, may know, we have, we've extended our evangelism meeting through the month of October because we believe that the invitation of God to his people is not over. There are some people that God is still wooing, still drawing still saying, I want you to come home. And today, you came to church knowing that that was you. As we do each and every week, we give every man, woman, boy, and girl an opportunity to respond to Jesus. Let me be clear today what this response is. Heaven's a prepared place for prepared people. People who believe Jesus has given salvation as a free gift. We don't earn it. People who believe God has promised that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. People who believe that the Sabbath is an anniversary where God wants to spend with his people. People who believe that God is saying, according to Revelation 8, 4, to come out of confusion and to join and to link up, not with the people who are infallible, but the people who've been destined for mission. He's saying to be baptized. And there's someone here today. God has placed that on your heart. There are two categories. You've never accepted Jesus before. If this is your first time. Or perhaps you have strayed away from Jesus and now he is saying, my son, my daughter, I want you to come home. In just a few moments as we do every week, we're going to stand and we're going to pray for you together as a church. I'm going to ask for Brother Crosby, Brother Griffith, Brother Baker, if you would just come. Brother Lane, if you would come, just stand here in front. Just stand at a gas, and if you would stand too as well, just face our audience. These elders are standing with your pastor to issue this invitation. And I want you to pray, if that is you, that God will give you the courage to come forward when we stand. Who am I calling? Somebody today who needs to be baptized. Give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. 
We want to hold it long, but pray now that God will give you that courage, and he will, won't he? God has the ability. Denise, I'm going to ask you if you just sing that last verse, if you will. Let's stand together all over this place. And if that is you as she sings, just slide out of your seat. Give one of these elders your hands. Give Jesus your heart if you know God is calling you today. We won't hold you long, but there's someone here today, maybe in the balcony. Is the Holy Spirit calling you today to give your life to him? Would you sing that now? Claim to Where are you? The world this church is praying for you today. Slide out of your seat. Jesus is saying today, I'm making my call to you. Where are you today? Don't miss this opportunity. You in the balcony? Come even now, even as the Spirit is speaking to your heart. This time is for you. You here today? And elders, if you just pray even now, we're going to ask the Lord to move upon your heart. Where are you today? Hear Jesus speaking to you. Don't let this opportunity pass. Are you ready? Are you ready for Praying Jesus to, you. to come? The Bible says those who come will be faithful. Are you faithful? Jesus is speaking to you today. Don't no wait this. Don't, don't miss this opportunity. Would you pray, church? Would you pray for somebody? Would you pray that God will give them the strength and the courage today? That Jesus would move on their heart. Where are you today? You stood for right. We're going to pray soon, but this is your time. Give your heart Jesus to Jesus today. Sing Hallelujah. You. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing that. Sing that. Are you ready? Yes. To stand in yes. your place. Listen to the words of that song. Are you ready today? That's the Spirit speaking to you. Are you here today? Are you Face. Hallelujah. Thank God today. Can you look yes. up and say, Yes, yes, yes. This is my Lord. This is yes. my Lord. Are you ready today? Would you come now? Are you ready? This feel is for you. For Jesus. We're closing now. Are you ready? For Jesus, are you ready for Jesus Hallelujah. to come? Father, we, we end this formal appeal, but your appeal is eternal. And right now, Lord, as you wrestle with the hearts of men and women, we thank you, Lord, for your spirit's conviction. Now, here is our prayer today. My prayer today is that every single person in this church would be able to hear those words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of the Lord, that we might receive a perfect home in a perfect place. So seal that decision today, Lord. We do pray and we thank you in the matchless name of Jesus. Let those who believe that name, would you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated.